hotel room, always working. Yeah, yeah. Out in California, what up, County, folks? We're back. Um, took a little bit different approach during the pandemic. Everybody started a podcast. I actually didn't do a single one. Um, upgraded my equipment, just kind of figuring out what I really want to do with this thing. Um, a lot of my new podcasts been popping up and doing current events, you know, doing this, that, and the other. Um, I'm going to take a little bit different approach. Um, I, I love the business aspect of wrestling. I love the marketing aspect. I also love the coaching aspect on a, on a, on a huge level as well. Um, but I'm going to kind of pick some different things. I, I'll still have some guests on and chop it up with those guys. But, but for the most part, um, I just want to do something a little bit different and uh, talk about some different aspects of wrestling that maybe some people don't cover for – whatever reasons, whether it's, you know, maybe lack of education in the sport from business and marketing aspects and, and things like that. But, uh, man, if I didn't sit down and talk about the Smiths and kind of my take on it, yeah, um, man, I feel like, I feel like there's so much in that audio documentary. Um, if you don't know what's, what, what I'm talking about with the Smiths, Ryan Warner from a Say, Wrestling Save My Life podcast who exploded on the scene, man, maybe a year and a half ago and has pretty much pushed himself to the forefront, um, you know, with guys like Jason Bryant, stuff like that, that have been doing, you know, tons and tons of podcasts and having uh, amazing guys on their show. Um, he was commissioned, from what I understand, by the, the Wrestling Hall of Fame to do this audio documentary about the Smith family. And, dude, like, I follow wrestling – I keep up with wrestling a ton and there were so many little nuggets of history with the Smith family and Gable and early eighties through the nineties and, and John Smith's coaching career and Pat Smith. It's just, and Leroy Smith is just a, an amazing story. So first, if you haven't listened to the Smiths and you're listening to this, man, I strongly advise you to hit pause on this. Go listen to the Smiths. He also just posted uh, un, uncut versions of, um, uh, Mark Branch interview, Dan Gable interview, and, uh, and, and John Smith interview. A lot of stuff that, that got left on the editing room floor that's just amazing nuggets. And if you're a, a guy like me who approaches stuff like that, trying to get an edge coaching, get an edge just, you know, with your own personal goals in life, man, there's so many tiny things there. Um, I kind of relate it to watching The Last Dance. When I watch The Last Dance um, with Michael Jordan, and, and you, you get to see inside the mind of an elite competitor. There's tons of little things that if you watch it more than once or listen to what they're saying or l look a little bit deeper into what they're saying, there's tons of things in there um, uh, that, that you can just take away, you know, just, just to better yourself as a, as a coach, as a competitor, as a human being. So, um, and I thought it was kind of funny. Seth Duckwork, who covers a ton of Oklahoma State stuff, uh, put out a tweet. He's like, I just want to sum up the Smiths for you. So I want to make sure I give him credit. I could just, I could just read this, what Seth said, and then boom, it's a wrap. And I I'm done with this episode. Um, he says a two time NCAA champ, John Smith won six consecutive world and Olympic medals while simultaneously coaching a team that was given the death sentence penalty by the NCAA, then leading them to an NCAA title in their first year of probation, all before the age of 30. Um, I might have still been like wetting my pants and eating my boogers when I was 30 before I figured out what I want to do in life. But when you look at the magnitude of what that guy did, you know, win Olympic and world gold medals while still in college and things like that, it's just amazing what, what this guy was able to accomplish from a competitive standpoint. But the thing that I looked at and the thing I kind of correlate with uh, guys like John Smith and Michael Jordan is just the mental edge they were able to – not only get to, but refine and maintain as they continue to compete, as they continue to get to the pinnacle of their sport and try to get further beyond the pinnacle of their sport. Um, and it's three, three main categories that I kind of broke down chunks, and I made tons of notes while I was listening to it, and I would re-listen to stuff and make more notes. And, you know, my kids are probably tired of hearing about the Smith quotes because the last week and a half all I've been doing is talking about the podcast of, uh, you know, the Smiths and, and the little pieces I took away. Um, elite competitive mindset uh, is, is something that, you know, those guys just find another level 
to to keep their brains while they're competing. Um, preparation, uh, the 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 links that these guys went through to prepare um, to to win at that elite level consistently, and um, just and then and then lastly, being self aware. You know, just being self aware of uh, not only where they're at physically and mentally, but the environment around them, you know, and what they're allowing themselves to be exposed to or not to be exposed to. Um, so those are the kind of things that I wanted to kind of dive into and, and specific incidents um, that, you know, took John Smith from this guy who was really good in high school and he got to college um, to a guy who didn't have a great, you know, first season in the NCAA, um, not placing and then going on to win two NCAA titles, but, you know, also winning six consecutive uh, Olympic and, and world gold medals, which, you know, we never thought at the time it could be beat. Jordan Burroughs is, you know, pushing the envelope of trying to get there. But even if he does, even if he went out and won eight, it's not consecutive, right? So there'll always be that question of consecutive. Can somebody do six consecutive um, and it, it just goes to show, like, you know, how ridiculously tough that is to do. And, and, and not only that, at a, at a young age. Um, so, you know, competitive mindset and the things I took away from it when, when I'm talking about uh, when I'm talking about John and just listening to him talk about the things. And a lot of people, you know, uh, will equate the Goodwill game success he had. You know, so he comes into college um, and, and, and this quote, you know, is, is telling to me. Um, and, and I've really tried to figure out how to relay it to, to my, you know, high school, middle school guys is he talks about, he said, everybody that comes into college is, you know, four time state champ, undefeated, won everything under the sun. He was like, and then you get to college and you realize, you know, you're just, you're just another guy. You're just another athlete. And he said, what, what guys start doing is, is as they realize the amount, the extra amount of work that they have to put in on top of being good at wrestling and managing lifestyle and, and, and all that stuff. He said, they go from thinking they're going to be a four time undefeated NCAA champ to being okay with being a one time NCAA champ. And then that mindset goes from, uh, you know, I want to be a one time NCAA champ to, to now it's okay. If I'm just a, a, a couple time all American. And he was like, the problem is they start to settle. Um, and I think that's, that's extremely important, you know, as us coaches at the, at the, at the middle school, high school youth level is preparing those guys for, for that moment. When you get to college to where within a season, you don't just go from, Hey, I am going to be an NCAA champ to man. It would just be nice to go to the NCAA tournament. And you start converting your mindset to, I'm going to be elite and great to, I'm just going to settle for, for X. Um, and he talks about a lot of times in his career where, where he, where he was, almost kind of getting to that point, you know, but, but when he reflects back from, you know, not having the freshman season that he wants and he takes this red shirt year and he goes to the goodwill, you know, he, he gets better and better and better, you know, and then he has this kind of breakout at the goodwill games and he starts to realize, okay, you know, I feel like I can win at this elite level. I feel like I can go back to college now and, you know, and, and, and be an NCAA champ, you know, then he goes back to college. He thinks he's going to be an NCAA champ the next year back you know, and he meets Jim Jordan in the finals, you know, and, and, and he was like, you know, a lot of you, a lot of times you walk away from a match and you think, you know, if I, if I got one more chance to wrestle that guy, I can beat him. And he was like, you know, I had to be self-aware at that point. You know, I, I couldn't lie to myself. I wasn't going to beat Jim Jordan that day. I wasn't going to beat him a month from now. You know, I still had a ton of work to do. Um, so, you know, the way that John Smith was able to layer his motivation, and he talks about it in different ways. He talks about, you know, just being disappointed that he lost. Of course, he didn't lose that many times in college or in his career period. Um, he talks about he talks about those 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 different levels of um, being able to uh, kind of quantify his emotions, right? So he he goes back to the Gil Sanchez loss. Um, they go wrestle in a duel. He gets beat by Gil Sanchez team packs up and goes home and he drives to the next tournament. He doesn't go home. Him and his roommate drive to the next tournament and he's going and, 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 and trying to find this guy. And he, and he explains, he said, you know, I wasn't mad that I lost that match. I was embarrassed. He was like, and that, and that, that to me meant something different. You know, when he, when he goes all the way to the Omaha open to try to meet Gil Sanchez, he, he showed up there to, to, to beat Gil Sanchez 
not to avenge a loss, but because he was embarrassed. Um, and the way, and, and, I, and I go back and think about some of the things Michael Jordan said in the, um, in, in the last dance, these guys took certain things in their career personal. And a lot of times it wasn't the, he, he, was, he was in the, the, the finals of the NBA championship and he missed a shot to win the game and, like, it was all over the news or whatever. Like, he was bringing up uh, uh, stories about a rookie made a comment about putting up 30 on him and he would go out and put up 40 on that kid instead. You know, John Smith was, was motivated by certain things where people were like, oh, man, you're, you're, you're underclassman, you know, He's really, really good. You know, like, it's okay. It's just a loss. You know, he, he had an unbelievable way of, of kind of categorizing things in his mind that made sense that pushed him to be an elite competitor. Um, and, and that's something that as a coach, man, I can, I can take a story like that. I can take a, a, a situation like that, and I can kind of, you know, chop it up to a kid and be like, look, do, you, do, we, do we just want to chop this up as a loss, a bad match, or – you know, what are you feeling right now? Do, do, do we need to get in the car and go drive and, and find, and this is an old school way of thinking, you know, John Smith didn't go home with the team. He, he drives, you know, to the Omaha Open and then beats Gil Sanchez. But, you know, he even reflects back on that and he was talking about the lack of respect he gave Gil the first time he wrestled him, you know. And again, that's another great coach and teaching point to where he's talking about, you know what, I, 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 I didn't respect this guy as a competitor. I thought I was just going to come in and stomp a mud hole in him, and he beat me. And he didn't just beat me, he beat me up a little bit. And then I chase him down to the Omaha Open. I go and wrestle him there, and it was everything and I could do in my power just to beat him by a couple points. You know, and he's walking away from that going like, there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, and he talks about a lot of different aspects, you know, from that elite competitor mindset. Um, and it was something that kind of correlates. I, I remember Chael Sonnen talking about this a while back. And it might even be in when I had him on the podcast or not. But he talks about winning a thousand little battles inside of a six-minute match or a 15-minute fight. Um, and I think for us as coaches, we want to go out and win a six-minute war, right? Or we want to win a six-minute battle, but are we preparing our kids to win a thousand tiny battles within that one six minute match? And I think a lot of times with kids that possibly overthink the competitive realm or possibly overthink um, a period or I got a, I, a position like I got to be good on top. Like, how can we refine that down as a coach and just be like, OK, you know, this battle right here is is the angle battle. First thing we got to do is get an angle. And the second thing we got to do is, is win the level battle. So it got to be lower than the guy. And third thing we got to do is, is, is win the position battle by getting to the single leg. You know, so all these little tiny snippets and chunks of things that John Smith's just saying because that's the way he thinks, I'm just writing down left and right. Like, how can I take what the great has done or what some of the greatest have done and correlate that to what I'm doing with – you know, little Johnny that walked in here, you know, has been wrestling for a half a season, you know, but wants to be an Olympic champ one day. You know, how do, how do, I, how do I get him, progress him over the next eight, ten years to get to that point? Um, and he talked a lot about Coach Chesborough, and it, this was something that, that I feel like I got stuck in the technique um, uh, role as a coach as opposed to that conditioning power. Um, type of coach because there's a lot of coaches that we're going to win on conditioning and physicality and pressure, you know, and, and we're going to create diamonds out there. Um, I'm more of a skill first coach and he talks pretty in depth about the coaches that he's had around him in, in his career. Um, and he talked about coach Chesborough always putting skill first. And he was like, I think a lot of times when you're coaching athletes, um, we have a tendency to not put skill first, and we focus so much on the conditioning and, and the conditioning and the power factor. Not that you don't need it for wrestling. Everybody needs it, right? So, but does that put so much stress on them, making them worry about are they constantly in shape or their weight cuts on point to where if anything happens with their shape, they can't fill the gaps with their skill? Um, and again, another beautiful nugget right there that 
if you don't look deeper into the words, you know, John Smith's kind of putting out there and talking about his career and how he progressed and the coaches that impacted him, you know, there's so many small takeaways there, you know, and, and, and me selfish as a coach, man, I'm, I'm just trying to get, get as, as refined and as efficient I can with the communication with my kids, but also being able to correlate it to, to real world things instead of just saying, Hey, I said it, just do it, believe it. You know, there, there's a correlation there and everybody gives Oklahoma state. And now when you go back and look at it, everybody gives us Oklahoma state. Oh, they're slick. You know, they're just going to try to out trick you and this, that, and the other. Well, are they really trying to be slick and out and, and out trick you or are they just being skillful? And some of the other programs, I'm not saying they don't know how to wrestle and they don't know technique, but where's the emphasis, right? You know, and, and, it, and it's always going to go to Iowa, Oklahoma State. You know, Iowa is going to be these caveman type guys, which, you know, you look now in the last, you know, probably five, six years, it's, it's not even the case anymore. Yeah, Iowa's going to be in shape. Yeah, they're going to be tough. Yeah, they're going to be in your face for, you know, seven minutes. But, you know, it's not like Iowa's coming in a bunch of cavemen and they can't read. And then Oklahoma State's coming in, you know, valedictorians. And, and, and it's a battle against, you know, brains versus brawn. Um, but you do see dis- you do see distinct separations between how coaches coach. Um, and I like I like the perspective he gives of not being in shape or a kid always obsessing about his shape starting to be a stress factor and weigh on him. Um, but you could play both sides of the coin and say, hey, a kid not knowing skill, you know, that could weigh on him as well. So I think balance is, you know, is, is huge there coaching wise. Um, and you know, I got, I got so many notes in here, you know, for things, you know, and I just wanted to touch on the big chunks. Uh, but he also talks a lot about balance. Um, and for a guy like John Smith, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm going to get, you know, that type of thing. We're like balance and, and, and things like that. Um, but you got to figure 17 year old kid coming into college, 17, Coming into college, some kids these days with the whole backs or birthdays or whatever it is, you know, they're getting to college at 20 years old. You know, John Smith's 17 years old in college. Um, but he talks about, you know, like the there there two more chunks, you know, huge chunks. And and again, I'm just I'm just I'm just spitting from a, a lot of my notes and things that I took is like, you know, so like that elite competitor mindset. And then you got the 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 fear or the fear of lack of preparing. He actually talks about that or the obsession to prepare. Um, And then, you know, just being self-aware in general, uh, whether it's after a win, after a loss, and and, and essentially just being honest with yourself, just being able to look in the mirror, you know, and and be honest with yourself as a competitor, as a, as a coach, as a, as a human being, as a teammate, Um, you know, and, and again, like, you know, he starts college in 17. A lot of kids these days are entering college at 20, 20 years old. You know, so he's, he's three years behind the curve, which back then I'm assuming 17, 18 was the, the average age coming in. But again, you're still talking about a 17 year old kid entering a grown man's world. Um, and, and, and one of the things he's, you know, he, he talks about is, you know, they go over to Tbilisi and, and this is one of the, the trips that he talks about was one of the turning points. So like Goodwill Games was kind of like, I've arrived, you know, but the Tbilisi trip was like, holy smokes, I'm not as good as I thought I was. So Tbilisi, if, if you don't know, back then was tougher than the world championships and the Olympics combined because Soviet Union hadn't split up yet. So there was only one guy at every weight for the entire Soviet Union. And we know how deep the Soviet Union was. Um, but all of those guys went to Tbilisi. Um, so it was literally the toughest you know tournament in the planet every year. Um, and one thing that he talks about is like, his mindset when he was there. And he was like, I remember complaining about how cold it was in there. He was like, I was, I was worried about how cold it was. I wasn't worried about preparing myself to compete or all the work that I'd done to get there to beat, you know, the Russians. I was worried about how cold it was in there. You know, of course he doesn't win the tournament. You know, he's taking this long train ride back. I believe it was Moscow. And, uh, and he, and he, he tells a story about looking out the window and starting to realize how hard these people lived. And like they didn't have a choice but to not live hard. And that's all they knew. And he's sitting here, you know, feeling sorry for himself and talking about, you know, uh, 
that point where he realized these guys are born with an edge. You know, and you can go open parentheses, yeah, but they cheat and take steroids, close parentheses. Doesn't matter. And, and even addresses that in, in the uncut interview. I don't think it's in the, in the actual uh, production version. He was like, if they are taking steroids and they're not getting caught, then I got to learn how to beat them that way. So I got to get a better edge on top of the edge that I'm already creating. But he talks about just observing the world these guys lived in on a day-to-day basis. And then he was like, and then I think back about all I was bitching about was how cold it was in the venue. He's like, that's why I lost. I was focused on the wrong things. He was like, these guys probably weren't even worried about having warm water, taking a shower later because that's the way they lived. Um, And just being able to observe that and be self-aware and make an adjustment. And then he talks about how that led to his crazy training hours at Gallagher. You know, and, and, and going up there and running at 11 at night at 2 a.m., whether he stayed up and went and ran or whether he just set an alarm and woke up in the middle of the night and went and ran because he had to fabricate an edge, you know, and like that's that's crucial to me when I'm, I'm talking to an athlete and I'm like, you know, OK, well, you go to practice every day and then you come here and get a little extra work in like, you know, at the compound, like, is that enough? Are you creating a big enough competitive edge to the guy that you know, has won it three years in a row and, and you hadn't qualified, like, how are you going to create an edge and, 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 and bridge that gap? You know, and, and everybody's got different levels of crazy, right? Like, I, I don't want all my kids waking up at two in the morning and, and going and running in a, in a dark gym, you know, but the ability for elite competitors to fabricate an edge mentally and physically is just something that, you, you, you got you to gotta understand and you got to get inside their brains and you got to observe their behavior and, and do it. Um, and he talks about the preparation to do something that's never been done before. And, and the difference between knowing the moment and respecting it or giving it too much respect and letting it overwhelm you. Um, and again, that's another, you know, huge nugget coming out of that is like, all we do is train for the moment, train for the moment, train for the moment. We're training to win a state title. We're training to win a national title. We're training to be NCAA champ. Um, but how much of that moment fires us up versus scares the hell out of us? Um, and that goes back a lot to balance. And that goes back a lot to believing in your training. And that goes back a lot to believing in everything you've done to get to that point. You know, and, and, and knowing that you're going to be the best version of yourself on that day. And if not, you go back to the drawing board and, you know, and, and fix it and, and, and move on. Um, but his biggest, you know, the, the biggest takeaway for me with, with Coach Smith is his confidence through preparation. Like, after he kind of got that, that slap in the face at Tbilisi and after, you know, the Gil Sanchez loss and some of this stuff, he's starting to realize that he might have prepared perfectly on a physical level, might, might not have always prepared perfectly on a mental level. Um, and, you know, for him to be self-aware and go, kind of rewind and go back to that stuff was just just very refreshing for me to, to, to kind of see he, him talk about. Um, you know, can you, can you go in a college room and go two months without scoring a point? You know, and knowing that's, you know, going to be part of your growth. And, and, and when you get to that point, you know, and, 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 and a perfect example of that is Mark Branch. Um, and to me, the uncut versions, man, Gable and Smith's uncut versions were amazing, but Mark Branch's was so refreshing because he's just a character anyways. Um, and, and he talks about Pat Smith kind of turning him into the guy that won an NCAA title with a losing record. Um, And there was an actual conversation with, I believe, John and Pat at some point, or, you know, Pat was talking to somebody else, and, like, Branch is starting to beat him in some goes at practice. And I think either John or somebody was worried. He's like, man, I don't know if Pat's ready to win his fourth. And Pat takes the other perspective, and he's like, I'm going to win my fourth. Branch is going to win a title. Like, no, he's I haven't gotten that bad. He's gotten that good. You know what I'm saying? So it's one of those is like, you know, that's a perfect example of taking a guy who really didn't get a lot of scholarship money, probably ended up on Oklahoma State's roster because they were on that that probationary period and couldn't really keep anybody on, or recruit anybody new. And they were just doing the best they could to keep everybody on the team without leaving. 
Everybody burned a red shirt. You know, uh, Freed burned a year um, to stay on that team when they had that year of probation. So, like, you know, Branch is like, I kind of got in the lineup because the team wasn't that good and then stayed the course. And, you know, here we are talking about one of the craziest stories in the NCAA tournament ever is, you know, Bart Branch coming in with a losing record winning the NCAA title. Um, you know, so so that type of thing of just confidence through preparation, I think, is such a undervalued um, thing we preach to our kids. Um, and the self-awareness aspect to me, I'll be honest with you, it's not that I thought Coach Smith was just this dumb caveman wrestler guy, but I, I, I grossly underestimated what a deep thinker he was and the perspective that he gave in some of the interviews on, you know, just how to prepare for pressure. You know, and, and a lot of this might be hindsight, obviously, you know, if we know everything going into every moment, it's, 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 it's easier to deal with, but he talks about, you know, and, and this was more with, uh, with more with Pat, I think than it was with, with him that he was talking about was, you know, once you get pretty good, you know, getting, getting good isn't, isn't that big of a deal because nobody knows who you are and you're under the radar or whatever. But when, when you, when you start winning, that's when the pressure kicks in. You know, when, you, when you're the guy, that's when the target's on your back. And I think a lot of times, like, you know, we focus so much on getting there, and it's like, okay, we're there. Holy smokes. Like, now we got we to gotta, we gotta still progress and grow and, and, and prepare with all this other baggage that came with it, the pressure, the target, you know, people gunning for you. Um, and he talks about losing to Lazar Reynoso. And that being kind of like a big rival. Um, and he said, you know, he was coming up on his fourth, fifth world title. And he's starting to realize there's a little bit of lack of motivation. And I even talked about, you know, he never went on trips. He never took vacations, stuff like that. And they go on this trip to Cancun after he won his fourth title. And he was like, I, I couldn't have fun. Like, I couldn't, let, I couldn't let, let go. I couldn't lay back. Like, I'm four world titles into this thing. Like, I can't take a week off. You know, this. People are going to catch me. I can't take a week off. I, I need to be Reynoso. Like, this guy's got a, this guy's got a, a win over me. Like, it's, it, it's, it's bothering me. And I think you can take that to a bunch of different levels. And I think you can take that to a level that, that's not healthy. Um, but it's different levels for different people, right? Some people can operate at that high level and sacrifice and be like, look, you know, I'll, I'll take a vacation when I'm done winning six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 world titles, or I'm going to have balance and quality of life. And my whole life's not going to be about all this stuff. Um, but I think if we go back and look at history, there are very few people that were kind of part-time or half invested, you know, that ended up being, you know, some of the greats in sports, business, what, whatever it is. Um, but like probably the most gangster self-aware thing that, that I observed through this entire, you know, seven episode series of the Smiths is John Smith is the most gangster dude of all time. And if you think about it, not just what I opened up with and what he did, but this guy went from 17-year-old freshman thinking he's going to be a four-time NCAA champ to not even winning his first two years trying to be an NCAA champ to creating a low-level attack um, that ended up changing the world. But this guy is traveling the country and putting out DV, not DVDs, probably not even DVDs, VHS tapes back then on how to actually teach it and use it for the rest of the world. So that's like me creating the secret sauce and then sharing the secret sauce with everybody else or me creating secret sauce that makes me badass and then sharing the secret sauce with everybody else while I'm still trying to be the baddest ass on the planet. Like to me, that's the most gangster thing of all time. And then giving everybody the answers to the test and then still going out there and beating them when it's time to take the test. Like that's, ultimate elite level of confidence. You know, that's Babe Ruth calling his shot. That's Jordan telling people he's going to put up 40 on him and putting up 50. You know, that's like unbelievable amount of, of self-confidence. But if you go back and look at the layers of why, it's because of all these things that he had in place. 
of just being self-aware of, of him and who he was and, and what got the most out of him and who he needed to be around. It was the, the tireless preparation, you know, that, that built that self-confidence. It was consistency. It was creating an edge no matter what that meant, whether it was training at 2 a.m., you know, or, or getting extra workouts in it. He talked about sometimes he was working out three, four times a day, you know, um, and all of this technical kind of preparation stemmed from, you know, traveling all around the country at a young age with Coach Chesborough and learning how to teach technique, learning how to be systematical with technique, you know. And I'll be honest with you, man, I'd heard about Chesbr- Coach Chesborough, um, and I didn't, I didn't know this dude was that big of a G. Like, the way Coach Smith describes him and talks about the way this guy thought and the way this guy taught and coached, like, man, like, I got to do some more research on Coach Chesborough, and I, I got to get in, in that guy's brain even more because, you know, I, John Smith gives him all the credit in the world, you know, and, 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 and John Smith's the greatest, you know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, and, and that skill over power, that skill over conditioning, you know, is just something that, that resonates huge with me as a coach, you know, trying to get one kid who maybe has goals of just starting versus a kid who has goals of, you know, being, being an Olympic champ one day. You know, and, and how do we create those layers as a, as a, as a coach and, you know, as a mentor and, and, and put them into play, you know. But if you think back about John Smith's career and you think about back about the things he did, you know, uh, you know, all the medals, all the titles as a competitor, created one of the, one of the leg attacks that's revolutionized wrestling. Then he goes on to do it at the coaching level as well. Um and he gave you a lot of the answers to the test in this, in this podcast. So um, I can sit here and talk for 27 hours about it. But, you know, there were certain turning points in, 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 in John Smith's career. Um, and I didn't even really talk about Leroy getting arbitrated out off the Olympic team by Randy Lewis um, and, and him using that. Uh, and, and Coach Gable even talks about that in the interview. He was like, I think part of that is what made John Smith, John Smith. Um, and John talked about it a little bit, but he didn't talk about it as a motivation um, as much as, as, you know, somebody that's bitter and hateful about a situation. He just kind of, the vibe I got from it is I looked at it as a situation that I would never let happen to me. You know what I'm saying? I would never let I'm going to beat everybody so bad and I'm going to be so dominant and I'm going to be such the guy that nobody could go to a courtroom and be like, yeah, that was wrong. You deserve to be on the team instead of you. Um, But like I said, man, I I just want to kind of get my take on it as as kind of a coaching perspective and some of the nuggets that that I took away from, you know, the things that that John Smith talked about, you know, and and, and Mark Branch and and, and Pat Smith, you know, and and, and part of the things that, that Pat talked about you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't being, you know, a four-time NCAA champ to, to be better than John. It was, it was being a four-time NCAA champ because that was something, you know, you know, Pat Smith wanted to do. Um, and he talks about a specific conversation that, that he had with John um, leading up to the fourth title. And he didn't want to take a red shirt, um, but they were under, they were under probation. And he was like, look, man, like, you know, Freed's going to burn a year. You know, you're talking about transferring to Oklahoma. Leroy Smith was coaching at Arizona State. He was like, do you want to win your fourth title in a different singlet or you want to win your fourth title here? You know, and, and, and they talk about wanting to do it versus having to do it. And, like, if I have to take away anything from this podcast that, that Ryan did and talking to Gable and Smith and or Coach Smith and, and – Pat Smith and some of these great guys, it's talking to these kids about wanting to do something with their life or wrestling career versus having to do it. And when you want to do it, it's a whole different perspective instead of having to do it. Because when you have to do it, it's a totally different mindset. When you're having to do it because your uncles did it, totally different mindset. When you're wanting to do it because you want to be great, totally different mindset, landscape changes, everything about your mental makeup changes. And again, man, there's just so many nuggets in this. So if you're a coach and you're trying to figure out how to be better coach, if you're a coach and you're a good coach and you're trying to 
trying to get that that that's that edge here and there to be able to communicate with your elite athletes because it's easy to coach the middle school kid that don't know a lot about wrestling. It's the nationally ranked guys in our room that we're trying to get just as much growth out of at at 16, 17 years old as we did when they were seven years old. That's even tougher, you know. So there's so many elite coaching angles and tips and 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 points of view in this that man I, I'll tell you man I, I'm gonna go back and rewatch it and I'm gonna make some more notes um I can't thank Ryan Warner enough for taking the time to get all these small details collected and put in a format for crazy wrestling junkies like me to listen to um and lastly doggone it if if John Smith really did eat Wendy's before he made his his second Olympic team. Uh, and it, and if if Mark Branch really did eat bacon cheeseburgers from Waffle House before he won NCAA titles, I actually text Mark Branch. I was like, please tell me this is a true story. And he was like, I was just too dumb to know any different. Um, God bless him. I'll tell you what, like, I hope... All my kids don't start eating <laughs> eating Wendy's and eating bacon cheeseburgers from Waffle House before big days in their life. But uh, like I said, go check out the Smiths. The hustle is back. I got a lot of great ideas, man. DM me, shoot me a text, email me any topics that I want. I'm gonna have some. I'm gonna have some amazing guests on the show. I'm also gonna take some time and just um, believe it or not, I don't know why, but people DM me a lot of time and want my opinion on certain things and my perspective. So. Um, I'm going to do some brain dumps like this every now and then and just take a lot of thoughts and throw them down on paper and, and spit them out to you guys. Give me tons of feedback, um, good and bad. Uh, the hustle is here to stay. I'm going to try to get at least one out a week, if not more. Um, but stay tuned. I'm fired up. I'm back. Let's do it.